Okay, welcome everyone. So uh, first of all, I'll introduce myself. I'm, I'm Paris Mullins and uh, I'm here in California. And today we have with us none other than Zach Brown. Zach, how are you this morning? Actually, it's your afternoon for afternoon you. Afternoon for me. Yeah, no, everything is good. And yourself? Good, I'm good. So, so wait, so where in the UK are you now? I'm in uh, Surrey, which is okay. about uh, 25 miles outside of London and about 10 miles from the factory. Okay, fantastic. Cool. So um, I just want to kind of introduce uh, or, or, or talk about the, the format for some of the people that haven't joined uh, one of these before. If you look at the, the bottom right hand corner, there should be a, a word box where you can type in questions. So uh, feel free as we're as we're conversing, you know, put your questions in there. And, uh, and, and, you know, we can kind of see uh, what you guys are asking. And, um, and, and yeah, um, I noticed that somebody just typed in now, it says Zach is upside down, that his video is upside down. We had this issue yesterday, but it's not for, it, it's not doing it for everyone. It, it, I noticed it's, it's some other people's devices. So if you sign out and sign back in, it, it, should, it should fix itself. Yeah, because a lot of people are saying they can see him fine. So it, it, uh, it, it's, just, it's a small glitch and it's usually on, on, the, uh, on the viewer's end, it's not on our end. Um, we spent all day yesterday troubleshooting it. So um, just try signing back out and signing back in and it should, should fix itself. So if it doesn't, just close your eyes and listen to his beautiful voice, yeah. So, okay, well, to start things off, I'm going to ask the first question. And, you know, Zach, everyone knows who you are and, and what it is that you do for, for McLaren, but not a lot of people know your interesting story and background of how you got there and really how things started with being a driver. So could you give us some background on, on, on how you became to run one of the most famous Formula One teams? Mm, absolutely. It's, uh, I'm not sure how interesting it is, but it's a story. So... Uh, I'm originally from Los Angeles, and um, my family was not involved in racing. I just enjoyed uh, race cars as a kid. My first race was the 81 Long Beach Grand Prix, and then uh, used to go to Riverside and Pomona for the drag races and the sports car and, and NASCAR races. And um, in junior high, I had a buddy who uh, family raced. So uh, he took me to the Long Beach Grand Prix in 87, uh, which Mario won. And uh, from that, that moment forward, I, I knew I wanted to race. And I got started in, in carts, uh, kind of a funny story. I was on Wheel of Fortune Teen Week and won a bunch of uh, watches at uh, 13 years old that I then went and sold to uh, buy my first goat cart. So that's kind of how I, I got started there and uh, ultimately wanted to race Formula One uh went over had success in carts and then uh, went over to europe had uh, uh won my first race that's probably the most success i had uh in the following 10 years or close to and um wanted to pursue uh driving there uh, needed to do my own sponsorship so uh because i didn't have family resources uh to to race so uh, that's where I started to understand the, the business of sponsorship. Uh, came back from your, I raced in Europe in uh, early 90s, mid 90s against uh, Josef Verstappen and uh, uh, Max's father uh, and uh, Jan Magnussen, Kevin's father. And uh, so I became good at, at sponsorship. Uh, came back, raced the next five years in the States, started a, a company that was called Just Marketing, which is really just to do deals to make a living in, in motorsports on the corporate side. And um, that started to take off. I, I did my next five years in IMSA and FIA GT and some Toyota Atlantic, things of that nature. Uh, stopped in 2000. Uh, at that point, my company was probably a dozen people uh, in, in Indianapolis. Business then took off, NASCAR took off, and I got into the business of, of NASCAR. So I, I caught that wave just in the neck of time. And um, uh, long story short, fast forward, I sold the majority of that company in, in 08, um, then sold all of it uh, in two, uh, 2013 to a company called Chime PLC, uh, London uh, traded company. They put me in to be 
the group CEO it was like an IMG, a big 1500 person sports agency. Uh, I was supposed to do that for, for four years, but it involved other sports beyond motor racing. <laughs> so much like in school, if I wasn't interested in a subject, uh, I'm not interested. So um, fortunately, I got the opportunity to either go to Formula One uh, or McLaren at the same time. It, I thought I was going to go to Formula One. It was such a long process. It took about a year and the McLaren thing came up. Uh, quickly, but but fast with everything that was going on there, and um, w- was actually we were planning on going to, to Formula One, but then uh, the closer I got to to McLaren, I'd been a McLaren fan my entire life. I'd done lots of business with them, but uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to a, a racing team versus the 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 league. And uh, I'm thrilled with the decision uh, I, I I made because I'm a a racer. So it's a much more exciting job being in the garage. And so I got the opportunity to join there at the end of 16, um, which, you know, joined at a time where McLaren's probably um, at its weakest point on track and commercially, but I saw that as a uh, opportunity. Um, It was uh, pretty clear to me why things had gone wrong. So I felt it was fixable, but it's going to be a, a journey, not going to happen overnight and started out on doing that. And um, yeah, that's how I, I landed there. I, I also, you know, I knew the shareholders, the majority of the shareholders in, in Ron for 15, 15 years. So it wasn't uh, unfamiliar territory to me. I'd been in the uh, MTC uh, a million times up to that point. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, that's, that's it's great. Um, you know, being a racer, being a driver, being a car enthusiast in general, you've got some pretty cool stuff yourself. Um, and uh, actually a question that came in from from none other than Mr. Tom O'Gara himself. He said, uh, you know, basically what what would what is your favorite car to get out on the track when you can? Um, that's a hard one to answer because they're all uh, different. And I right. uh, uh, love them all for different reasons. Um, you, you know, my I'm a Formula One first and foremost. I love IndyCar. I love sports car racing. I love uh, rally. Um, but in, as far as pure performance would go, I have uh, Lewis Hamilton's uh, last uh, two-time winner with McLaren, uh, 2012. He won Italy and the U.S. Grand Prix in it. So to get out and drive that, that's definitely the most ultimate car. Yeah, that's uh, got to be pretty special. It, it is. It's also terrifying. So yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I don't race it. I, I, I test it. You know, there's no place really to race it, nor nor would I. Um, so so that, and then as far as kind of what I race most often, um, it, it's probably my 935. Yeah. Um, that one Daytona and Sebring was cool car, John Paul Jr. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a cool. It's a pretty, it's a pretty raw car. I mean, you have yeah, to be, a cool car. you know, it's a very involved car, very analog. <laughs> yeah. 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 Especially yeah. in contrast to the Hamilton car. They're you know? two different beasts. That's for sure. Yeah. So kind of along the same lines, um, for those of you that have, that have uh, visited MTC, McLaren Technology Center, which is kind of the, the home and hub of all things McLaren, um, you know, racing, production cars, there's something called the Boulevard. And so one of the questions here is about, uh, you know, the Boulevard constantly has some impressive cars from McLaren's history on display, and it does rotate from time to time. Um, and you pass by it, I'm sure, all the time. Um, if you could take a car from the boulevard, what car would it be? Yeah. Um, another good question. Uh, uh, there's a lot of unbelievable uh, cars there. Um, you know, ultimately, Senna was my, um, my hero. And yeah. 88 had to be, you know, I think the best race car of, of all time. So if you had to pick one... I think it would be the uh, Senna uh, MP44. Yeah. The 44, yeah. Uh, the the Le Mans winner is uh, unbelievable. We have uh, uh, Johnny Rutherford's Indy winner 
um, yeah. which just acquired about uh, two years ago, which was which was great. We had the really. So you guys haven't always had that car. We had his uh, Johnny Rutherford's Gatorade second place Got it. winner, and then the gentleman who had bought the Rutherford car was was up for a a deal and a trade. Um, and so we, we traded up to the uh, Indy winner, which was in Papaya as well. So that yeah. was cool. So at the, at the um, we do reconfigure the boulevard for different occasions, for different yeah. reasons. But we have a um, master plan, which is our yeah. kind of plan A, which I spent time on, which is a, a, it is a lot of fun yeah. going around with a gentleman named Michael Edgecombe, who looks after the MTC for us in our our brand and spent uh, yeah. many hours going this car here, this car here, this car here, because it tells the story. You walk in and it's papaya. It's Bruce's first uh, race car. It's yeah. our most current race car. It's kind of our papaya era. Then uh, our first sponsorship, big sponsorship was Yardley, Denley, Denny Holm. So we got that car and then it transitions to the Marlboro, Fittipaldi, Hunt, yeah. uh, our first carbon fiber tub that we did in, in the industry with uh, John Watson and into your Lauda, Prost, Senna, and you transition to the West era, which is uh, Mika and, and Kimi, and then on to the Vodafone, which is Fernando Lewis, Button. And then uh, we need to create the next uh, next chapter. Because it's, yeah. been, um, it's been a while since we've updated the last most successful era right well hearing you list all that it clearly explains how why it's so difficult to pick which one you take so yeah, yeah. you know um so let me go ahead and look over here and see some of the questions that have been filling up here um so let's see here uh well okay so what is what is the greatest f1 duo so i'm sure they mean what's the best uh, f1 driver pairing you think in in, in history um I mean, I think it would have to be Senna and Prost. Um, yeah. Pretty toxic uh, yeah. Uh, relationship. Uh, Mansell PK was yeah. a pretty awesome um, lineup. Um, you know, short lived, but Fernando and, and Lewis, uh, Lewis and Button was pretty uh, strong. I, I, you know, McLaren, if you look at the grid, I think historically have always had the best combination, not every single year that we've, we've, we've not always had a superstar yeah. in the car, but uh, for the most part, we've always had the two best drivers we can get where um, I think some of the other teams have a more clearly defined one and two or and two would be almost putting it too low. It's one and 1.5. Right. <laughs> uh, um, where, where you know, we, we go with two number ones. And I think uh, Daniel and Lando uh, in 21, I think that'll be the most exciting. I, that was going to be my next question for you. Is how excited are you about that? that new Yeah, it's, it's, that's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be good. They're, they're two big. Some of the two most charismatic guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, that F1 uh, seen in a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, uh, it'll be good out of the car and it's going to be great in the car. Daniel's yeah. pretty uh, ruthless. So I think yeah. uh, it's going to be good for Lando. Um, have him, you know, continue to yeah. raise his game as he gets experience and Daniel's tough and tough on his teammates on the track. So I think, you know, there should be a good rivalry there. Yeah. So it's, it's funny, um, you know, speaking of, of uh, Lando, you know, one, he's just a great personality and his amount of engagement with fans outside, you know, off the track and what he does with social media is, is pretty awesome. And he loves to give kind of a behind the scenes of what it's like to be a young driver, in, you know, the world's biggest sport. Um, tying this back over to you, you know, he's a big sim racer and, you know, with everything going on right now, you see drivers in all categories sim racing which has been pretty epic, you know, seeing some of these guys, you know, doing sim racing in 70s F1 cars and you know, it's a mix of indie car guys and guys from the past. Um, you just had a go in sim racing recently, mm. didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was. Uh, what did you think? It uh, it's hard. Um, you know, I've had a sim for a while, but I've never had uh, time to get on it. And it's not yeah. a video game, and so it's not something that you can get on and master it in 
10 minutes. It takes right. uh, hours and days, and I've never had the time to be able to put into that. And even though I'm working um, harder than ever now, um, I'm not traveling. So I, yeah. I, I got invited and then realized that when I was Bathurst in a supercar, a supercar which is a dangerous combination of yeah. difficulty uh, to get started with because Bathurst is unbelievable and those cars are, are fast and hard to drive. So I spent probably two weeks once I realized I committed to it was didn't want to make myself look like a fool. And um, it's it's hard. You work up a sweat and you make a mistake and you're 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 done. We we did pretty well. I ended up uh, qualifying third, which was uh, the fastest I'd gone by half a second. It was my last lap in qualifying. And it had the same build up as if I was climbing. It was stressful. I was yeah. uh, P10 up until my last run. So I was pissed off about that with 20 people in the race and then um had to put together you know for for me my best lap and um and it wasn't easy and then uh McDuin, the uh, super bike champion uh, unfortunately yeah. wiped me out so i ended up finishing seventh and then there was a reverse grid and started 17th and finished 15th and got caught up in mayhem um but it's a it's a lot of fun and it's it's hard and lando's unbelievable at it. yes yeah lives on the thing yeah no it's it's super impressive so um let's go through here so there's like i said questions are piling up which is great um so uh what do you think is going to happen with the 2020 indie season uh texas is going to go off uh which will be a one-day event yeah uh, next that's the one in june right june 6th yeah, yeah. Uh, june 5th june 6th um so that'll go off. That's going to be tough for, for us. We've got two rookies who have never been there before right. and the way they're doing it, because they want to get us you know, in and out fast. It's one practice session and on the qualifying. So. Yeah. There's going to be zero testing, right? Yeah. I mean, pretty much yeah. everybody's so, just, you know, we got some testing on the, the road courses, so that'll be tough. Our guys, yeah. just need to, um, you know, get to the end needs to be yeah. a goal. Uh, and then July and in Indy, uh, Road America's now a doubleheader. I was on the uh, the, the team owner call uh, last week when they you know they made a couple uh, tweaks to the calendar, which were good. Doubleheader at Road America, which is an awesome yeah. race. So I think that's going to uh, come off of the Indies in August. They're still optimistic they do it with fans. Your yeah. guess is as good as mine, whether they uh, achieve that or it's a more limited audience. Maybe they sell a, a third of the availability to keep some... Uh, social spacing but yeah it uh, looks like it's going to go off yeah yeah I, I was talking to connor daly the other day and those guys are just they're they're amped they're they're excited to get get back in the car you know yeah, yeah. so yeah, sure um kind of following along the same lines a, a question from a fan here um you know do you think the british grand prix will still be held um it's been yes i would have said yes and no to that about four different times last week <laughs> on four different days yeah um it's the current plan is for it to be uh the first two weekends of august as a, a double header weekend a weekend the uk uh, by what has been announced by the uk government currently we couldn't achieve it with uh the the balance of the schedule yeah. that we're putting on but Apparently, we've been told uh, that they're going to work with us and make some exemptions around uh, Formula One um, and kind of be patient. I think reality is because no one knows what this is going to look like in two or three weeks. I think sitting here today, I think we'll get a British Grand Prix and they'll work through it. But I think that comes with a big uh, asterisk that, right. you know, that, you know, all depends what happens next week. It's a moving it's a target. Fluid, it's a yeah, fluid situation. Yeah. Um, you know, an, another question that's on here, it says, uh, which team do you consider to be your biggest competitor uh, in the constructor standings um, this year and next? Um, unfortunately, I think Racing Point. Uh, yeah. And I say unfortunately because I'm not a uh, big fan of how they've gone about um, being competitive, which is effectively they've admitted it. Um, copying 
uh, the the Mercedes Mercedes uh, car. Yeah. Yeah, I think it. Uh, I think it is um, probably within the the rules. Um, I'm not sure it's within the sporting intention of what right. uh, Formula One stands about. So I, I think it's legal. Um, and, but but and so it's given them a good good car, and uh, so I think I like our driver pairing uh, a lot more. Yeah. So I think they might have a uh, a great car, but maybe we uh, outweigh them and combine talent uh, with our drivers. I think Renault um, AlphaTauri seems to be uh, very fast at times, maybe a bit inconsistent. Uh, Alpha was not far off. And again, last year they took a turn a few weekends at being kind of the best of the rest. Uh, seems like Haas has gone uh, backwards yeah. and Williams has gone forwards, but not maybe enough to catch anyone other than maybe Haas. Uh, but I think it's going to be tight. I think it will look uh, like last year, give or take one or two positions moving, Racing Point getting stronger. And then I think next year, 21, will probably look like 20. We're using effectively the same cars. There'll be limited upgrades. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think this, you know, 19, 20, 21 will be one um, package, if you'd like. And then I think 22 is when it gets really exciting because it's it's not quite a new car, off, but it's it's a big reset. Yeah, agreed. Um, so uh, right here, it said, you know, Ferrari started selling road cars to fund its racing program. Um, how does Zach see the connection between road cars and the race cars and what that does for the business? Um, so obviously racing's in the, you know, is the DNA of uh, McLaren and everything has been born out of our uh, racing. I think, um, you know, we share a, a, a brand. I think we both build the brand to uh, different audiences and similar audiences. We we obviously have a uh, much larger reach as a, as a sport. Um, and it's, you know, McLaren's a very aspirational uh, brand. And then of course, you know, automotive uh, speaks to, you know, our real target uh, customer or, or bullseye, if you'd like, which is someone who uh, ideally loves McLaren's uh, racing heritage and loves our cars who can afford our cars and is, uh, you know, a, a, a customer who's got, uh, I think, automotive customers, there's probably some such as myself that it's just kind of one and the same. Uh, and then there'll be other people that maybe don't follow Formula One or been exposed to uh automotive first or, or the other way around, but uh, we, we go hand in hand. And um, I think, you know, that's what makes us and Ferrari, obviously I'm completely uh, biased, but, uh, you know, two just mega automotive racing uh, brands. So even though uh, a brand like Lamborghini, which I'm also, uh, a Lamborghini fan and uh, consumer uh, <laughs> doesn't quite have the uh, racing heritage right. that Ferrari and, and McLaren have. So it um, yeah, very I, brief I, stint in Formula One for Lamborghini. <laughs> uh, very brief stint. They uh, went with we almost went with them. We have the car. Senna tested it. Uh, said yeah. it was an unbelievable engine uh, back in the early '90s. I think before we went to Peugeot, if I'm not. Yeah, uh, mistaken. And um, yeah, I don't, Lamborghini's a cool, uh, cool brand. With my, with my time in O'Gara, I, I was a uh, Lamborghini brand manager at both of our locations at different times. That's been my uh, the background on my screen for a long time was Senna testing the, a pure white livery free test yeah. car that had the Lamborghini yeah. engine in the back. Yeah. Super, super cool piece of uh, history. It, it makes you wonder what, what could have happened. You know, and, yeah. and would Lamborghini have been more involved in racing based on the success of that? And um, what a what a crazy collaboration between you know between the yeah. two iconic brands. Yeah. Um, uh, switching back over to you as a driver, does Zach prefer to shift with paddles or a manual with a clutch? Uh, definitely manual. 
<laughs> that's that's my age, um, but yeah, no, it uh, definitely made me. And and actually, I, I'm going to ask this: What is your daily driver? Uh, most of the time, I just sit in the back of a, a Range Rover because the traffic yeah. around here is horrific, and I prefer to be on the phone. Uh, I was, was going to say so. texting and driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that doesn't work. So uh, I don't really. I mean, I've got another another Range Rover that if I'm kind of running around, but I either uh, I'm not driving or go for short runs, uh, mostly with the kids, the Starbucks, and we yeah. pick something out of the, the, the garage, which is fun, but they don't get, I probably drive myself 1,500 miles a year. Wow. So not, not, not much. You'd be great for a lease, very low mileage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so let's get a bunch of questions here. Uh, ah, okay. When do you think we can expect to see a new title sponsor for, for McLaren? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's not something that we've uh, pushed hard on. It would have to be, uh, I've, I've got with the business plan, uh, my commercials laid out, which don't include a title. Uh, so it would be, gravy, if, if you'd like, in the sense of I'm not uh, budgeted for one, not trying to find one. I would accept one. It would have to be under the uh, right terms, uh, which is is long term, because I think a title obviously commingles with our brand. Right. And, you know, especially because we have an automotive business now, I think uh, we're very protective of the McLaren brand. And so it have to be a great company long term um the right economics of course and so um we're just kind of one of these days we'll come across one we have had a a few conversations i do want to because it's a topic i've spoken about before and i think some people get confused what do you mean you don't want to have a title i want to have that title level of branding on the car you know ultimately uh tastefully we want to sell every square inch um but i kind of like the name of the team you know mclaren you know f1 um vodafone mclaren f1 was awesome and i would do that again but it would have to be that type of long-term great brand um big economic big economics um but I, I'd like some gravy because Formula One's expensive, and the more gravy right. you have, the more you can right. spend or return to your shareholders. And um, so, so we're up for it, but not long, long-winded answer for it, not not kind of waking up every day uh, yeah. chasing one. Yeah, yeah. I don't think people realize how much thought goes into that because, like you said, the brand association is is huge. You know, I mean, somebody can sit there and stroke a check, but there's a whole story that goes with it. And, and like you said, the obligation that you kind of have to McLaren as a brand and, and the service that you'd have to provide the said title sponsor, um, you know, and it's funny because, you know, you don't see that as much anymore. You know, I mean, you see Marlboro in the background, you know, the Philip Morris involvement with Ferrari. Um, you know, most people don't know how, how that whole situation set up, but there's really not a lot of, uh, you know, you know, in terms of like Red Bull and things like that. I mean, their their association with Aston Martin. I mean, you really don't see, like you said, the, the you know the big days of you know Vodafone and things like that. I'll, I'll ask you this though: if you had to pick a brand, if you, if there was a title sponsor that you could have, and just in a, in a fantasy world, because you just feel like you could do a lot for their brand, they could do a lot for McLaren, and just the synergies would be mega. What what brand do you think would would be close to the top of your list, if not the top? Uh, probably one that we already have is, is not just not as a, that large a partner, uh, well, title-wise, but a big partner is uh, Dell Technologies. Yeah. Um, and the reason being huge consumer name. Right. Huge B2B name. Absolutely. Techno technology, um, leader, innovation, you know, it's it's a giant uh, technology brand, and, and we're yeah. kind of a technology automotive brand, and they Absolutely. talk to um, hundreds of millions of consumers, and also, you know, very high end C suite 
you know, almost the people they do business with or our automotive customers and who they're selling laptops to, to the, the masses. That's our, right. our race fan. So they talk to both of our uh, audiences. So, you know, I, w- I would say someone like Dell would be right at the top of the list. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so let's get to some of the questions here and they're piling up, which is great. I love seeing this. Um, Oh, is it? Why do you believe Honda was so unsuccessful with McLaren uh, this time around? Um, <laughs> that's a. Um, I'll, I'll give you an abbreviated uh, answer because it was quite a quite a journey. I came in at the uh, the end of it, but I think yeah. I saw enough to kind of understand uh, the whole situation. I think um, reality is it. It takes a long time uh, to develop uh, and, and catch up to the Mercedes and the Ferraris of the world from a standing start. So I think um, being the uh, test mule uh, in hindsight, uh, which is natural that you're going to have that, we probably um, didn't have enough time and patience to wait for them to get to be competitive, which they are now. And even Red Bull, when they took them, they first put them in Toro Rosso. So they had four years of development to get to yeah. where they are now. Um, they they had all the right uh, resources and they spent a, a fortune, uh, fully committed. They didn't have uh, much uh, Formula One experience uh, at the factory. They used it. Right. Uh, a lot for development of their R&D and just not a lot of Formula One experience in there. I think that was um, something that they changed, uh, something that we had uh, asked them about quite a bit and, and pushed and just couldn't ever kind of get it done. They ended up uh, hiring some external consultants uh, with, with German names uh, who knew their way around Formula One engines. And that really started to, to help. Um, and I think that, that got them on the journey. And then they're, you know, with a good team. I think while uh, some people, uh, you know, fans, what have you, made comments that, you know, what role did we play? I think the role we played was we weren't um, as good as we thought we were. So while there is no doubt it was a very uncompetitive engine and um, them being the least reliable most of the time would not be uh, our fault. Sometimes what you're doing on the chassis will lead to an engine issue, but for the most part, so it was, but at the same time, you know, we thought it was all of all them. So when we um, divorced and we put the Renault in and and we, uh, we were terrible. And it seems like we got worse over that season. It was clear, yeah. okay, you know, for sure the engine wasn't uh, where it needed to be, but even if right. it was, we, we weren't where we thought we were. And so that really started the uh, rebuilding uh, process that's been going on for the last uh, year and a half. And, and now I think we've got all the uh, right people in place. And Andreas yeah. is a great team principal. Uh, we're going to the Mercedes engine. We have two great drivers. Um, we've brought on a lot of sponsors, and it's all going the right direction. It's just going to yeah. take some more. Uh, it's going to take some more time now. Yeah, which you know, it's funny. The Mercedes and McLaren pairing is just as iconic. You know, when you think about from from the past. I mean, I know there's a lot of uh, nostalgia with Honda and and. and you know, the Senna days and pros. I mean, there's some great great stories of. Um, you know the, the 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 success that you guys have had with with Mercedes in the past is pretty mega, and obviously the, the current success Mercedes experiencing. Um, yeah. w- w- when will we see that engine in the car? Because I know that they've delayed. Obviously, the will that go into the the rebody car? Twenty one. That'll go into okay. the twenty one car. So yeah. it's going to be a bit tricky for us. We're the only one. So the cars have been uh, for the most part frozen. We're going to have a token system for upgrades. So you're going to get a limited amount of upgrades. We've had to use some of those tokens to modify the chassis to install the engine, which is a bit of a bummer because 
the modifications aren't necessarily performance. Performance, it's just to accommodate. They're just getting the, yeah, they're getting the engine in. That being said, we think there's some performance to come just in the engine. So while the tokens, uh, chassis modifications won't make us faster than what we're putting in will, um, there's going to be very little testing. Fortunately, it's a very reliable, it's the most reliable uh, engine. Yeah. You still need to get your plumbing and your cooling uh, right. So, yeah. you know, there's some risk there with an engine change that um, you're going to have to kind of get that right and have little less time to uh, on track develop it. Um, but and then 2022 20, is what I'm uh, most excited uh, yeah. about. Not that I want to skip over 20. 21 i'm very excited about those but i think 22 is when you know i hope the conversation turns more to who's going to be our biggest competitor next right. year and it's not um racing point with all due right. respect but it's the answers mercedes ferrari and red bull because that's where i'd like to think we can start annoying yeah. them more often in uh, absolutely 23. yeah absolutely and, and actually Mud, how long is the engine deal for with, with Mercedes uh, to the end of this um, this development cycle, okay. which looks to be 24. So it's it's long term. So so there is no guarantee that in that in in the with the 2022 or the 20 yeah the 2020 no yeah the 2022 car. So it it it, it is not a guarantee that that engine will be in the back of that car. Oh no no 22 for sure 21 oh. and beyond. 20, yeah, 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 hundred percent. Sorry, I, I did, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know if you meant the development of the, of the current car. So. Oh no no no! We'll, we'll we'll be racing the Mercedes from uh, twenty one onwards. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Okay, so let's get to some questions here. Um, let's see here. Ah, uh, okay. So not one of your drivers, but you, you'd be able to you know give some insights. So what do you think will, will happen with Vettel? Do you think he'll actually retire or do you think he'll find um, himself back on the grid somewhere? I, I think he'll retire. Yeah. Um, I don't think he wants to retire, which is a shame that a you know, four time world champ kind of, yeah. I mean, he could get a seat. Just, I don't think there are any that are desirable uh, to him outside chance Renault, but I, you know, I think he wants to get into a race winning uh, situation, um, you know, and then if, you know, something happens with someone gets injured, God forbid, or falls out or what have you, I, you know, I think yeah. he'd be the first guy, um, uh, Mercedes would call if something happened to Lewis or maybe even Botas or, yeah. um, but I, I think odds are, I think he's going to be out of the sport. Do you, do you think he'll do kind of what Alonzo has done and kind of you know, find some other stuff that he's wanted to do before. I I think he could maybe be enticed into sports cars. I get the sense yeah. that he would take a a year or two off. He's just had, I believe, his third kid. Yeah. Um. He doesn't strike me. You know, Alonzo's you know single, no kids. Yeah. So he wants to race, race, race. So I think yeah. my guess is Vettel would kind of do what. Prost and Hacken and Shumi did, which is stop yeah. for a year, start to miss it, and then maybe it comes back and wants to race Lamar or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, on on the, the driver topic, um, you know, when do you think we're going to see, you know, we've got an American team principal at one of the best teams. When are we going to see another American driver, you think? Um. It's it's going to be a, a while, um, unfortunately. I don't think there are many kind of in the system right now um, coming up through F3 yeah. and, and Formula 2. Uh, if there was more testing, you know, I, I would be comfortable putting someone like Joseph Newgarden in, yeah. in the car, um, but not with such little track time. You yeah. just, you know, because it would just take him – as it would take anybody, yeah, a little bit to learn all these tracks and unfortunately, to Formula yeah. One, you don't really have time to educate someone on Formula One. So, which is a shame. If there was more testing, then I would give Joseph a, a go and, and yeah. um, you know see how he got on. I think Colton Herta 
could be uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and I also don't personally subscribe to. You can certainly be twenty years old and enter Formula One, but I don't think at twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, right? You're you're too old, which I, I think a lot of the um, mindset to Formula One is you kind of have to be a twenty year old yeah. rookie. I, I've uh, in my time around drivers, Fernando's as fast as anyone. He's thirty nine. Yeah, uh, Kimi. Is Kimi, I was going to say 40. Kimi. He's yeah. he's mega. Um, I think drivers uh, lose motivation sometimes when they get older. You know, yeah. um, as opposed to the the talent. As long as the motivation's there, Scott Dixon's another great example. Yeah, I'd put that guy in one of our Formula One cars. You know, tomorrow if yeah. uh, he's he's awesome. So. Um, It'd be great to get a um, a known American. I, the, the days when they came over, it's a shame things didn't work out with Michael. Uh, they did with Villeneuve, but he's yeah. Canadian. But you, you know, there's no reason yeah. why. Um, you know, I think Michael was better than than Villeneuve. So Villeneuve did it in the right circumstances. Tons of testing into a front running car. When Michael joined, there was a limit on testing that year. Right um joined you know the car wasn't great um so i think you know to have it be a well-known american you almost have to come through indycar um, yeah. because it's a bigger story uh transitioning that way yeah it really is baptism by fire i mean it's crazy to see some of the drivers that we've seen dominate in indycar like sebastian bourdais and go over to f1 and really not leave much of a mark. I mean, there, of course, there's guys like Juan, Juan Montoya, you know, I mean, that was, a, a you know, pretty, pretty mega, but, you know, uh, Cristiano Damada, you know, a lot of those guys that made the jump, it was just this little dip on the radar, and, you know, that was it. Um, speaking of, of um, you know, one of our viewers asked about, um, you know, what do you, um, how much is your involvement in terms of uh, the, the McLaren Arrows, you know, uh, SP IndyCar team? Uh, qu quite a bit. I, um, you know, I like IndyCar racing a, yeah. a lot. Uh, I think it's arguably the best uh, racing. And um, Indy, uh, McLaren's won it three times, want to try and win it a, a fourth and a fifth. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, very, very involved. We have about a dozen people dedicated to the project um, at, at McLaren. Uh, Joel DeFerrin, uh, the IndyCar champion, Indy yeah. 500 winner, uh, leads the project for us. Um, we're, we have a decent amount of our technology being plugged into the uh, IndyCar. There's not a lot of modification you can do to the yeah. car. Um, so where we're really helping is in uh, simulation, um, which is something that, you know, Formula One excels at. And IndyCar has kind of less resources in that yeah. uh, area. So this uh, break that we've had from a McLaren being integrated into the team has actually been beneficial because we were trying to do it on the run of, of race while integrate, where now it's given a chance. We brought in Craig Hampson, um, who's one of the best known uh, IndyCar engineers. And we recruited him, won Indy four times, the championship four or five times work for Mario, Michael, Bourdais, et cetera. Yeah. And um, he kind of leads figuring out what toys McLaren has that can then be integrated into the, into the team. So, uh, which is a big reason why he, he joined. We've got two young, exciting drivers. Um, you know, this kind of lack of track time is going to, you know, not help. And uh, we need to make sure they, um, get to the end of the race because, you know, they need to not try and make up for all the missed time in the car in turn one of Texas. Um, but I think they're, they're fast in the, in the future. We have Fernando at the, the 500, um, which uh, should go a lot better than uh, last time. Yeah. This was the worst experience in my life by a country mile. Can't even think yeah. about it. it was number two. And uh, but hey, you got to get back on the, the horse yeah. and learn from your mistakes. And uh, uh, I made plenty of them in in uh, 
hindsight that uh, I, I would do differently, uh, obviously, this time. And, uh, and one of those was going with a, a team that already existed and had the experience yeah. that we thought we could uh, take from being a, a team that won, you know, it's won seven races in 10 years to, yeah. you know, I'd like to think it's a team that can win a couple races uh, yeah. a, a year and, and, and kind of see where it goes from there. So um, I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to not do Texas, depending on this uh, quarantine stuff. Yeah. I'm going to do Australia, or Australia, Austria, then go to Road America and then come back to Hungary if I'm allowed to dip in and out of, of England. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm raring to go. Your, your, your frequent flyer miles are going to rack up big time between the two series. <laughs> So um, I've got to ask you this question because I think it's hilarious and I think it's a nice little break up here. And it's from um, actually it's from one of our clients who the last time I saw you was with him. You helped him acquire a very special car that was once displayed on the boulevard. And his question is very thought provoking. Bangers and mash or in and out burger? <laughs> in and out by a country mile. Yeah. Because the first thing I do when I land in. California and I go to uh, Monterey, uh, which is unfortunately, well, it looks like the uh, historic race might happen. Everything else yeah. has been canceled uh, around it. I've, uh, I'm going to, I've withdrawn, which is uh, yeah. a bummer, but it's now going to be right in the, uh, well, qualifying will be uh, one of the weekends of, of Monterey and obviously the Formula One schedule will be a zoo, but uh, I, I think in and out burger is, yeah. is the best burger joint in the world by a country mile. All right. If any, any of our clients listening have any connection to in and out we want them as a title sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually staying on the topic of, of uh, U.S. and Formula One, what's a U.S. track that you would love to see on the F1 schedule? Um, and it could be from a driver perspective, not even yeah, from the fact yeah, that it, well, you know. there, there'd be uh, three. Well, there'd be more than three. That would be <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, and put aside Indianapolis, because uh, I think that's an awesome facility. But the, the road course isn't um, iconic compared to uh, Laguna, but it's obviously too short. Right. Um but that would be cool. It would be. Uh, Road America, it's way too yeah. bumpy. But yeah. I mean, that's to me the best track in, in North America. Uh, not far behind though, I think the Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen, yeah. Is, uh, you know, if Road America is a 10 out of 10, Watkins is a nine out of 10. Yeah. Um, Montreblant, I know uh, yeah. in Canada. Uh, that Lawrence Stroll owns uh, mm -hmm. that circuit, which has Formula One history. Yeah. Uh, that circuit is 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 beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So some of the questions here. Uh, so if if Fernando does do the five hundred and wins, um, what kind of effect do you think the Triple Crown will have on McLaren specifically as a brand? Um, well, we've won it before. Uh, yeah. At different different times, uh, it would be unbelievable for Fernando. He'd only be the second uh, driver uh, ever to to do that. I think it would be huge for us that we won the Indy 500 more so than the right. the Triple Crown. Um, this whole Triple Crown thing, I, I uh, like now, and uh, my uh, secret, if I'd if you'd like, of what I'd like. To accomplish, I'd like to win. I'd like to be the first team boss to win the triple crown because um, no team bosses won the triple crown. Teams yeah. have, but you know, McLaren was in different eras. So, um, you know, if I'm super greedy, I'd like to win the you know IndyCar championship, Indy 500, F1 World Championship, Monaco, and then I'd like to see us back at Le Mans and yeah. winning Le Mans. So. Um, if I could accomplish one of those three, I'll be thrilled, but, uh, the goal is three of the three, you know, and, and, uh, speaking of Lamont, I mean, you know, I know you're a big Indy car fan, but where, you know, if you had your pick and leaving all the, the racing politics aside, cause I know that 
with prototype and sports car racing, it's a bit of a mess and, and kind of all over the place. And you hear, you know, great news that, oh, you know, they're creating this new category that's going to be perfect for car manufacturers. But for you, where, you know, where would you love to see McLaren compete in terms of closed cockpit cars? Um, well, the good news is, and yes, it has been um, good news, bad news on, off on sports cars. I think they have now. Uh, finally and truly landed yeah. on a unification uh, of, of rules. Uh, and I think it's going to happen this time. And I think they've landed on the right rules. So I'm quite uh, bullish. They're trying to get it done for 22. I think that's going to be tight. Yeah. Uh, might be more like 23. Um, I'd love to see sports cars unified and back to the 962s and 950 six and that era and the Jags where you had them racing on both sides of the pond. I think that's going to come in certainly no later than 23. Yeah. And I'd like to see us compete there. I'd like to see us win Le Mans again. I think the fact that we have a automotive company, Le Mans would be more relevant than ever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because we are, a, you know, we, we weren't really, even though we made the McLaren F1 when we ran Le Mans, I wouldn't say we were a car company then. I would right. say we were a Formula One team that built this. Decided mega, to build a car. Supercar, yeah. It, um, um, and, you know, and then there was obviously a huge gap. We did some Mercedes uh, yeah. work for for a while there with the SLR and the Stirling Moss uh, mm -hmm. model. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd love to see us in Formula One, sports cars, and, and IndyCar. To me, IndyCar. that's the uh, perfect portfolio. Uh, and that's what McLaren always meant uh, to me is I always liked that they were, uh, you know, in multiple forms of motorsport. Yeah, you know, the diversification. Before my time, but the, the heritage and legacy of that, I think, is uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, and it'd be great to do all three at the, the, at the same time. Absolutely. Um, so this is probably the most loaded question in motorsport, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, which is, who do you think the greatest F1 driver is of all time? And, and I love the second part. And if it's Schumacher, who comes in second? <laughs> um, but I don't think you're going to answer Schumacher. No, no. Uh, he, he would be top three. Actually, Autosport just did. Uh, and, you know, I think it obviously goes by eras. And because we're right. all living in the last three, four eras, they tend to be the guys that yeah. you've seen so a uh, hard one to to answer to me senna was the best grand prix driver of yeah. all time just the most raw in right. in everything speed aggression uh, talent etc uh hard to argue schumacher's uh, statistics right um i mean he was awesome and hard to argue lewis's uh statistics right, now, right. Uh, to me and Lewis had a much longer career than Senna. You know, the cars seem to be, you know, more dominant than now. Um, in saying that, you know, Senna won a, a ton of races. But um, yeah. uh, so that to me, those those three, and I'd, I'd probably put them, uh, Senna, Lewis, Shumi. And I think Lewis and Shumi, there's not much in it. I think they have both... Uh, unbelievable work ethic and drive in different ways yeah. or different personalities, but they're clearly um, as wired as you get. But uh, even though I don't have a big personal issue with uh, some of Schumacher's uh, driving over the years, because I think all drivers have uh, had their moments of being dirty Senna, uh, yeah. one of them as well. Uh, Lewis, you would argue was, has been the cleanest yeah, uh, world champion, you know, the oh, least controversial absolutely. Uh, events. And on that yeah. basis, you, you'd kind of have to say Lewis has done it, um, you know, cleaner than anyone else. Yeah. No, and, and you're right. It's totally that the answer to that question really is era based because it's like there's so many, uh, like I think of like my old boss back in the day and uh, he would have said like Fangio. You know, right. and, yeah. and, and, and it's like, I, you know, which it's not that he's wrong. I just, you know, it, you have to kind of look at the circumstances. And, you know, with um, with Ayrton, it, it's very much, uh, you know, 
him as a driver versus, you know, with Michael, um, cause again, that's kind of like, I guess I would say my era when I started really, you know, watching, um, and what I kind of grew up with, you know, he really built a team around him, you know? So it's kind of like, if you look at, if you just threw Ayrton Senna in a car, didn't matter what it was, you know, what he could accomplish versus the team that Michael created, you know, I mean, he was in a Mercedes for a bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and I know he was out of the game for a little bit, but still not not to the to the same extent. But it just it's always a, an interesting question. I'm going to now ask you the most loaded question somebody could ask you, uh, which is if you could pick two of today's drivers to put them in McLaren seats, who would they be? Um. Uh, well, aside from our two, because I would right. kind of trade my fantasy team. league. This is purely because, fantasy yeah, league. Yeah, I, I, I would. Uh, I think the most exciting would be um, Lewis and, and Max. Um, yeah. And that yeah. would be, uh, that'd be pretty difficult to manage, but um, <laughs> you definitely have two guys wringing the neck out of the car yeah. and not leaving anything on the table uh, in different periods in their uh, careers. So I, I, that'd be a pretty, uh, pretty exciting and pretty expensive lineup. Yeah, yeah. You, you would, uh, I, I think that would challenge uh, what, I would what need a Ron Dennis had to go through. You know, so that'd be a full time job just managing those two guys. Um, OK, so let's see here. Um, uh, oh, you know, actually hopping back over to IndyCar and, and I think this is a great question. And I, I know Alex, so I want to ask this. What do you think about Alexander Rossi, um, you know, being, you know, uh, do you think he's up there with with New Garden? Would he, you know, you think he also should get a chance? Yeah, he's been uh, very impressive in. Uh, IndyCar, I like his uh, aggression a lot. He's extremely yeah. fast, but also very aggressive. Yeah, from what I've seen, you know, he obviously did uh, Formula One a little bit, but, you know, in a team that's no longer, it was really hard to get a, right. a, a read on it. He was um, pretty good in Formula Two. He, he won some races. He yeah. was kind of a top three driver, and that's a very difficult series. Yeah. Um, you know, extremely difficult. So yeah, I think Rossi's a, yeah. a huge talent and is for, Formula One worthy for sure. Yeah. Um, so with uh, with F1 being the pinnacle of motorsports, do you think that hybrid really has a place in it? Or would you like to go back to fully internal combustion engines if you had your pick? Uh, well, I'd like to go back, but that's never gonna, yeah. never gonna happen. happen. Um, Fantasy know, I question. <laughs> I, um, so I think, yeah, hybrid's definitely here to stay. And then the question yeah. is what, what comes next uh, after yeah. that? I think the engines in general are, are too complicated. I think the yeah. engine manufacturers are trying to figure out a way to do them uh, much less expensively, uh, keep, keep the relevancy. Yeah. But uh, they spend a, a, a fortune. And I can tell you when you take the um, engine cover off. Right everything that's going on back there it's so far from just a you know now they're power units um they're unbelievably uh complex the mechanics have to be very good to know what they're doing because you wouldn't just yeah. get a screwdriver and start figuring out how the thing works it's uh unbelievably yeah. sophisticated yeah well even even the dangers they present to like support crew you know, yeah, the no, whole, I mean, it's, it, it, when you can the laundry the list of things that you have to do and that the driver has to do when the car comes to a stop. I mean, it's a lot yeah. of um, people don't realize all, all that goes into that. Um, so let's see here. Uh, so what is your favorite McLaren livery? Um, they weren't far off. The the uh, Vodafone and the the West were both two iconic livery. I mean, I think all of the, yeah. the liveries, I think the ones in the, um, when we went away from Mercedes and kind of got the the last, when I joined the, the black and the silver, that those yeah. didn't do anything for me. Yeah. Um, it's a bit generic. The, the, the West uh, livery. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a huge Mika Hakkinen fan. I think he yeah. was as good as you get. He was, you know, he's in, Awesome guy. He's probably the yeah. best guy uh, of all the Formula One drivers I've come across. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's awesome. And um, I, that, you know, he was taken at the Shumi at the time. And because I was a, um, am 
was am a McLaren yeah. fan. Uh, I was rooting for Hackenden to beat Schumacher because uh, that was an unbelievable uh, rivalry. That was a yeah, great battles. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, for Formula One on their social media, you know they're they're obviously especially now having to kind of dig back into the past to to find you know content and some of the best stuff they post is the battles between those two guys. And, and, you know, you'd think they were racing carts with how much contact and, and some of the, the, the moves they made on one another. To me, those are the, um, the coolest era yeah. cars. Um, yeah. You know, V10s, they screamed. They were getting up to 19,000 RPM, unbelievably fast, yeah. looked cool. Those, to yeah. me, are the, you know, because even the, uh, the 2012 Lewis car, they had to, the the rear wing which was shorter and taller right. and the tires were small so i think the um hacking and error cars looked the coolest really well proportioned yeah yeah, yeah no ab absolutely um so i'm actually going to try and answer this or if you'll let me answer it uh, i'll ask the question first and i'll see if i'm right it says if you had a speed tail which you maybe do what color would you pick now i want to try this i want to say yes that you do and if I remember correctly, because I, I was lucky enough to see the car, if I remember correctly, it is black with orange accents, isn't it? Yeah, good. Good memory. Right. Look at that. So, got, got the, got the did answer. I didn't show, oh. show it to you, did I? Huh? No, no. But it was, it was, I think it had just been pulled on the boulevard or something. Yeah. It's one of the, it's, it's a pretty special car. It's one of the XP cars, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. it's uh, super cool. It's one of our... Uh, 30 different blacks that we have. Uh, it's yeah. amazing how many blacks well, Actually, that'd be, what, what black is it? Because actually I couldn't figure out which one. <laughs> it, it um, what it has, so uh, Axon Nobel who does the paint on it. Yeah. And it's unbelievably trick. I, I still can't yeah. kind of get my head around um, how they apply it. Yeah. It, it mine has a, um, it, it's a, it's a dark glossy black, but it's got yeah. uh, almost like, a or well not almost it does an orange flake yeah. that you can either see a lot of or not see at all the the car changes color on on light in different direction yeah um so the paint is stunning yeah. um and yeah i got the orange seat and the you know it kind of looks batmobile uh, it did, which i dig i mean which I think looks cool. so i, I dig wasn't it. kind of what intended but when i saw it when it was done i went Kind of looks like the Batmobile. So that, yeah. I've always liked the Batmobile. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, so, so you're moving on to the next question. Uh, what is your, oh yeah, well, it's funny. I, this could be interpreted a couple different ways. It says, what is your all-time favorite F1 race and why? So I, I guess that could be just be yeah, a race that maybe you, you watched that you just thought was a good battle or whatever. Yeah, what would you say is your, yeah, your favorite? Um, I think the one that stands out the most for me was Senna uh, Donington Park in 93. Yeah. Not necessarily the best race because he effectively lapped everyone. Right. But, you know, the first lap, everyone, you know, it's the lap of gods or whatever. Lap of the gods. Um, and, you know, yeah, it was, that, that was just Pretty the, the super most impressive. unbelievable Senna race. Um, you know, some of the, you know, Baku's, you know, some of the more recent races yeah. have been pretty. Brazil was was exciting. Germany was super exciting. So some of those are some of the, those aren't necessarily going to go down in history as iconic races, but right. they were uh, very, uh, very exciting. And then, um, I don't know, uh, the British Grand Prix 87 with, with Mansell uh, catching PK. That was yeah. pretty uh uh, unbelievable. Um, it's another one that that uh, that sticks out. Awesome. Um, so here's a great question, um, and I'm going to tweak it slightly because we already got the speed tail part of it. But what is your favorite McLaren road car? So I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit more specific, um, and I'm going to take out kind of you know the, the speed tail and things like that, and and talk more about the you know. The, the the sports series and super series you know basically uh yeah if, if you if you could kind of when you do rarely drive yourself if you had to take one from uh from next door at the production center what 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 would it be um the, the 720 i mean yeah. it's a, a stunning car uh, they're all stunning cars i've i've actually not driven a 
a Senna, uh, which I need to because I don't drive. There's kind of nowhere to take them in a yeah. Senna. It's kind of pointless driving it around London. So yeah. um, I need to drive one. I heard it's unbelievable. I, it yeah. looks like a monster. It, it's, it yeah. is a race car. It's effectively, yeah. um, you know, a GTE car. Um, yeah. The 720s. Uh, an unbelievable car. I think the, um, the McLarens in general, they are uh, like a 911. You can drive them anywhere, anytime, slow, yeah. fast. They're, they're easy uh, cars. Um, if yeah, I they're user-friendly. Very user-friendly. You can take them to Starbucks, kind of park yeah. them anywhere, where some of the other supercars are a little bit more of a process into and park and they're big and wide and, and you wouldn't be referring to a lamborghini event right. tomorrow, would you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, i didn't want to be disrespectful because i love it it's just not yeah. a, a daily driver you know it yeah. um in the same way the the mclaren uh the mclaren is absolutely um another racing fan question not mclaren related just what is your favorite racing livery period any series, any car, any era. Um, so uh, pretty hard to narrow. Yeah. Down. Um, you know the JPS yeah. cars to me were, you know, the most iconic. Yeah. Kind of growing up, right? Mario was winning the championship in '78, and Lotus was a unbelievable uh, brand. Um, so that's got to be right up the top. I always liked the Benettons, yeah, um, because they were so different and yeah. colorful. So I thought those were always uh, great liveried uh, cars. Um, I like the older Ferraris more than the newer Ferraris. Yeah, the, uh, Lauda uh, era um, or red and you know, white with yeah. the gold wheels and stuff. Yeah, those, yeah, those are those are cool cars. Um, you know, and then you get into the sports cars, things like the Martini, yeah. Lancia, and, and, you know, those were, uh, and, and Rothmans, I yeah. always thought that, uh, and the 956s, um, that was a pretty awesome race car. Awesome. So, um, dip back into your, into your past here in, in your previous life, um, and, and, oh, I actually, I guess it could fall under, um, your, you know, your, your current role, but what was a sponsorship deal that you were particularly proud of closing that you just got, um, you know? Yeah. The, 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 uh, the, the best one, uh, at the time, the biggest one and is a, is a top three in uh, all time, but it got overtaken at a later date by, uh, uh UBS in, in formula one when I brought them in would be crown Royal, um, yeah. in, in NASCAR and, Spirits had been banned for 58 years. Spirits were not allowed to advertise on uh, network television, weren't allowed to advertise um, in sport. You know, there wasn't an official um, spirit of the NBA, MLB, NFL, NASCAR. So um, I had Diageo in with Smirnoff Ice in nascar which got in under the uh, under the radar because it wasn't a spirit it was a a beer a um, flavored malt beverage and um then they gave me the task get us in the nascar and it took a year and i remember the dinner with uh the ceo the the north america ceo because it's kind of a north american product was you know you've got our unlimited support i budget within reason you know, get us in um, and took a year of politicking in Washington and the beer companies not wanting them around. And, and um, you know, that was kind of a Wall Street Journal article, not just because it was a, you know, NASCAR was the you know, commercial leader yeah. too. Um, so then kind of making that move uh, that opened up now, other than the NFL, there's spirit advertising in all major forms of sport. And so that deal, you know, wasn't just a big deal that, that involved politics and, and um, changing laws and rules. So that, that's that gotta be it. And, and then uh, in Formula One, when I brought uh, UBS in to be an official partner of Formula One, that was the 
largest deal that uh, Bernie had done commercially and Bernie and myself and the uh, chief exec of UBS did it. And it was great fun. It was a huge deal and it was a great deal. They were so dominant in the sport for the five years that they were, they're in, they're still in with Mercedes and Monaco, but in a smaller way. And uh, so those two would be my, my yeah. favorite because they kind of straddle um, both, uh, both big racing series. Absolutely. You know, so I just looked at the time. I didn't realize we went 10 minutes over. Um, there's still a lot of questions, but um, hopefully this means that you'll come back and do this again for us. I know your schedule is going to get crazy, but um, hopefully you'll, you'll agree to do this again and we can, uh, we can, we can ask more questions and, and uh, spend more time with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I appreciate everyone uh, tuning in. I know that uh, this audience is probably the biggest uh fans of the McLaren uh, brand, it would be good to uh, be able to interact and do this uh, live because I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, based on the questions that have been asked, passionate people uh, like myself that are just fans of uh, McLaren and, and Formula One. And I, um, I enjoy sharing um, the experience uh, and the opportunity to lead McLaren is, is, is awesome and a dream come true. And, uh, I like to share it with, um, uh, our partners, our fans, our family, our friends, cause it's a pretty, uh, awesome, uh, place to be. So the more we can share the better. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much, Zach. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And, uh, we look forward to seeing, uh, IndyCar start back up, F1 start back up and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you out there. Until then, I guess we'll have to catch you on, on for the people that haven't seen the Netflix special yet, which I didn't even get to any of the Netflix questions. But, um, but uh, yeah, so next time. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thanks good so time. much, Zach. Have a good one. See you, everyone.